understand your holy will. Grant our prayer, O Lord, that we realize our true relationship with you in this life and the life to come. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we continue to work with you in building your kingdom on earth. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we unite ourselves with you in the sacred mystery of the altar. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we recognize the greatness of this most holy sacrifice through which we worship you. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we feed on the bread of life, no more to hunger. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we have a share in the offering of Jesus on the cross. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we, who fill our lives with your ideals, be joined with you in the supper of the Lord. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we perceive always and everywhere your all-pervading presence. Grant our prayer, O Lord. May we end our days with your holy name in our hearts and on our lips. Grant our prayer, O Lord. Forgive our sins, O God. Grant our prayer, O Lord. Cleanse and renew our hearts. Grant our prayer, O Lord. Lord, bless us with the wisdom to praise you in spirit and in truth, so that by following your holy will, we may gain eternal salvation. Amen. So we've gathered this morning, um, and this afternoon we'll gather a second time for our annual chicken barbecue, and there's already a lot of people up there working. They were here at 7 in the morning uh, loading up supplies and heading up there, and they're already cooking the chickens. Uh, so I think we're going to have a good day. It's not as hot as it has been. Uh, so as we do gather at this time, though, for the Lord's Supper, I ask you in preparation for that to please make a private examination of your conscience. Lord God, Lamb of God, 
You are seated at the right hand of the Father, who sees our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. presume to be righteous in your sight, grant us the grace of humility, that we may serve you faithfully in our lives, and at long last enter through the narrow gate and into your kingdom. We ask for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The lesson for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah. I come to gather nations of every language. They shall come and they shall see my glory. I will set a sign among them. From them I will send fugitives to the nations, to Tarshish, to Put, and Lut, to Moshech, Tubal, and Javan, to the distant coastlands that have never heard of my fame or seen my glory. And even they shall proclaim my glory among all the people. They shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and carts, upon mules and dromedaries to Jerusalem, my holy mountain, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their offering to the house of the Lord in clean vessels. Some of these I will even take as priests and Levites, so says the Lord. Here is this is the God, this is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Give glory, all you people. Alleluia, alleluia. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Alleluia. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, as you cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me so I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. A reading from the holy gospel according to St. Luke. And Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? And he answered, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. And after the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then will you stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. And he will say to you in reply, I do not know who you are or where you are from. And you will say, We ate and drank in your company, and you taught in our streets. And then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and west, north and south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. For this is the gospel of the Lord.
strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. And this selection is taken from this morning's Gospel according to St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, one month ago may seem like a long time, and that's when we read the Gospel selection from Luke about the Lord's Prayer and prayer in general. But in the Bible, that reading and this morning are separated only by one full chapter. Now, back in July, we heard Jesus' parable about persistence in prayer. It was a story about a man who goes banging on the door of his neighbor's house, asking for loaves of bread because unexpected guests have arrived. The neighbor protests that he and his family are already in bed, the door is locked, get away. They may remember the moral of that story one month ago. Jesus says, even if the neighbor doesn't oblige because of their friendship, he will oblige because of the man at the door's persistence. Now, you may not recall that parable from a month ago, but we did share it, we did talk about it. But Luke has written a book, and there's no way that a person who is reading this gospel book about the story of Jesus could forget that parable after turning only a couple pages. And that's what we then run into today's gospel and another story of Jesus's that sounds remarkably similar. Again, in this story, the one that I just read, there are those outside, they're banging on the door, and they're begging the one inside, open the door to us. Now, in both stories, the one on the inside is God. In the first one, God is compassionate. He comes down and he shares bread in the middle of the night. In the second story, God refuses and he demands, I do not know who you are. Depart from me, you evildoers. And they sit outside where is the, where is the grinding of the teeth, which is, a, which is a euphemism for basically suffering and also by extension the idea of eternal punishment. So do these sound like the same God in such similar sounding story? Would Luke as an author, a very intelligent author, would he put two stories about God with almost the same kind of story about that banging on the door, let us in please, when he had both of those stories in such close proximity to each other and then have completely different messages about the nature of God? Or is there something else going on here? I think there's something else going on. First of all, Luke has made explicit mention of the fact that Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. And we heard that in the lesson from Isaiah. And it says at the end time, all peoples from all over the world will come to Jerusalem and that all people will bring their gifts, all people will come into the temple, all people will worship just like the Jews, and even some of those people who are from other lands will become priests and Levites. And so that's that end time idea that in Jerusalem and that Judaic faith that all people will somehow come together when God shares his sign. And Christians, we say that sign is Jesus. So this is an intentional reminder, which Jerusalem mentioned, that Luke uses at several points in his gospel to remind his readers where all of this story is going to culminate. Just like Isaiah, at the end of his gospel, says we're all going to come together in Jerusalem. Luke, throughout his gospel, puts in these little messages that Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, and hopefully we all know the message of what Jerusalem stands for. Everything in the life of Jesus was part of this message from a parable in an unnamed village about a narrow gate to his death and resurrection. They all culminate, culminate in the message of Jerusalem. So Luke wants us to understand this parable in the context of Jerusalem and to have Jerusalem help us understand what this parable is trying to say. And we better all know the story of Jerusalem. Luke says that there is not a single follower of Jesus at the foot of the cross. There is no compassionate face at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. He is absolutely alone. We should also remember that in Jerusalem, Jesus resurrects, and he resurrects for everyone. He tells his followers, from here, Jerusalem, you go out and you spread this message of salvation through me to all the world. It starts in Jerusalem. So no one deserved a visit from the resurrected Jesus he came back to us anyway. And he told the disciples to share the resurrection with everyone, everywhere, starting from where else but Jerusalem. And this is why Luke connects this morning's parable with Jerusalem. This is the context in which today's story of the one knocking on the door, it has to be read. This is one reason why depart from me all you evildoers and all that gnashing of teeth and everything else that should get us to thinking that something else is going on here besides the message of judgment and punishment. There, this message of judgment and punishment just doesn't seem to fit in 
with Jerusalem. So there's more points that point in that same direction. Today's second story, the knocking at the door, is Jesus' own clarification of his story about the narrow gate. The narrow gate is a free-floating story that Jesus once said, but we don't know the context in which he said it because the context in Matthew and Luke, where we find it, changes. And so Luke and Matthew have a different understanding of what the narrow gate means. The narrow gate, Luke, is not a message of fewer people choosing faith. That's what Matthew says. And Luke could have done the same thing if he wanted to, but he doesn't. Luke's is a message of a bottle. It's like when you're driving down the highway and there's construction or an accident, and all of a sudden three lanes have to get into one, and you've all been in that. You know what that bottleneck feels like. So as you're driving along, all of a sudden there's that backup. But at this point, Jesus says something unexpected. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense at first. He says, for many will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. What does strong have to do with this story? It seems a strange choice of words. It implies that some are, are trying to force their way through that narrow gate. And Jesus says, that just isn't going to happen. No one is going to force their way in. Jesus is, a, is offering a very open invitation to come to God and to heaven, but no one is going to force their way in. So who are these people trying to force their way through the narrow gate? And again, we run into a second surprise. They are the ones who think that they deserve entrance. We ate and we drank with you, Jesus, they say. We heard you teaching in our streets, they say. And Jesus says, I do not know who you are. They saw, but they did not perceive. They heard, but they did not listen. They watched as Jesus gave us an example of what we're supposed to do, and they did not change their lives. This is a timeless warning against assuming that being close to the faith is the same as practicing the faith. We all may know the story. We all may know the name Jesus. We all may know Christmas and Easter. We all know what churches look like. But if we don't practice the faith, we're those people who think, Jesus, we saw you in our streets. Jesus, we heard you teaching. And Jesus says, I don't know who you are. Even coming to church is not the same as being at church. I was telling my acolyte just before Mass started, there's an awful lot of people up at the, at the barbecue working already, but there's going to be an awful lot more of our very own Christians who think that going to a barbecue is the same thing as going to church in the morning. They figure if they're doing something holy day in the afternoon, then they don't have to do a holy day in the morning. We're just not getting what church is all about. The ones who want to force themselves to the narrow gate, you know, that's just not going to be a possibility because Jesus says no one is strong enough. The only way to get through that gate is to be like Jesus, to care about other people, and to embrace God. And this all takes place within that second story of the knocking at the door, the one that meant a kind and generous God just two chapters back. This is where Luke drops that intentional reminder of Jesus making his way towards Jerusalem to die and to resurrect for everyone, even though no one was there when Jesus needed them. This is where Jesus adds that the ones inside will be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of the prophets, in other words, all of the good and faithful people of the first covenant. And they will be then joined by people from east and west, north and south, he says, in other words, all of the people from everywhere who will be a part of the new covenant, the Christian covenant. It's not the ones on the inside who is the stern and unforgiving judge who refuses entrance and says, I do not know you, get away from here, stay out there where there's the gnashing of the teeth. It's the ones on the outside who think that they can force their way in, but never, ever bother to try to accept God's invitation to come in. And this is why the passage ends with those familiar words of Jesus. Some who are last will be first. Some that the world pushes to the side. Some that the world wants to forget. Some that the world doesn't care about. In Jesus' mind, they will be first. And some who are first, the ones who are prominent, the ones who are wealthy, the beautiful people of the world, Jesus says, some who are first, they will be last. The kingdom of God is upside down compared to this world. Our responsibility as a church is to proclaim this upside down, inverted message of Jesus' to preach about compassion and concern and even self-denial and humbleness so that our kind and generous God on the inside is more than welcome to invite us in 
because no one in the world is going to force themselves in. And may that be our prayer, that we as church can share that message with any and all. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty well, Lord, as we gather this morning, uh, we do offer our prayers and thanks for all those who are working to make today's barbecue possible. We also offer our prayers for the youth retreat that begins this afternoon in Goshen. We pray that as we gather as a diocese in our youth from uh, Sunday through Thursday, uh, that you keep all of us in your care, your protection, and hopefully inspire us all to come closer to Christ and to church. We also offer our prayers at this time for Marilyn Judah, who is battling cancer, is offered by the Tudrin family. We offer our prayers for all the flood victims of Louisiana, is offered by the Lord's family. We offer our prayers for the following who are battling cancer. Meg Connors by Ellen and Dodge Crosby. Brandy Clemens by Grandmother Dottie Baronis. Carl Dickinson by Joe and Peg Fuschuk. Fathers Ray Dreda, Jan Hilchek, and Maurice Lazelle is offered by myself. Richard Poe is offered by the Poe and Foster families. Two-year-old Jack, uh, Jack Sela is offered by Marianna Foster. And Frank Skrosky is offered by his twin brother Don, Skrosky, Gates, and Kirkendall families, and also Liz Bridgman, recently diagnosed with cancer and was raising three young girls on her own. Are there any other intentions that you would like to offer from the congregation? For all of these intentions, Lord, plus the private ones that we bring before your altar and in the privacy of our thoughts, we ask you also, Lord, to bless each of us here gathered, to bless those who are perished who are unable to be with us here today, and also those who are perished who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being of the Father. Through him all things are made for us, for our salvation.
bread that I will give is my flesh and the life of the world. Lord God, you do the great dignity and worth through Jesus Christ, you exalt and renew and sanctify. Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. 
most humbly beseech you to accept and to bless these gifts, these presents, these holy, unspotted sacrifices, which your holy church receives from you, imploring you to defend and guide it throughout the world, together with her priests and all true believers of the holy faith. Remember, Lord, your servant.
unshakable faith that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, to command that our offering be brought by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar into the presence of your divine majesty. That we who receive the most sacred body and the blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and passed on to eternity. To these souls, Lord, and all who rest in Christ, grant everlasting life. And to those who are in life strayed from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, mercifully shorten their sufferings. We ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, and all your saints who shed their blood for your name. Their hearts were always open to justice and mercy, and with lives patterned after their divine master, merit of eternal joy. Numbers in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But whom you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, all honor and glory are yours, in the Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Forever and ever. Instructed by our Savior's teaching and following divine example, we say with confidence, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Father, and the work of the Holy Spirit, 
Your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused for my judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may it become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master awaits in me a living faith, fervent love, worship, adoration, and a holy longing. Through this communion, make me a willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it at last unite me entirely with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives reigns with God the Father, in unity with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Shall I return to the Lord for all the graces he has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. The body and the blood of Christ. Thank you. 